Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Terrence Patterson, and uh, before I start, it, it dawned on me that it, it's quite ironic that I'm talking about my story, but I have it written down, <laughs> and I'll be working off of notes, but I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, but my story starts in Memphis, and just like many of you, I came from a humble, modest beginning. I uh, didn't start poor, but I certainly wasn't uh, rich by any means. But the common thread in my story is a blend of acquired talent and hard work. Um, I love the zoo. Uh, always had a smile. Uh, I never turned down an opportunity to do fun stuff. Um, and in fact, I was always incredibly organized, and I am to this day. Uh, I can remember always making my bed as a toddler and organizing my blocks before uh, going to bed. My parents instilled Southern values. Um, they made sure that I was always in environments that were conducive to success. But as I grew from childhood to adolescence to even the ultimate independence of adulthood, um, there were three themes that emerged to define my story. Um, following to lead, continuous mapping, and taking well thought, taking well thought risk. So first, this notion of following to lead. I'm the oldest of three boys, and we're, we're all four years apart, and so there were inherent opportunities for leadership along the way. Um, eating my kid brother's leftovers, taking their toys, or even uh, letting them think they were playing Nintendo when the controllers were really um, unplugged. But the true learnings that I had were really when I was in the eighth grade, and I had the opportunity to be named to the varsity baseball team in the eighth grade, and just watching older guys perform, watching them practice, um, I learned that a lot of leadership and growth is osmosis. Um, if you're close to leaders, you'll just pick up their good habits and their traits but it wasn't until I got to high school that I realized I was starting to have opportunities to truly lead in my own right. So the, by the time I was a sophomore, at the end of my sophomore year, I was named the starting quarterback of my football team. And I'm actually in a leadership position, but to be very candid, I was younger than everyone that I was leading, a group of juniors and seniors, and I didn't know how to lead. And so I was actually watching and mimicking other older players, looking at them at their position, understanding their behaviors, and emulating them because all I knew how to do was work hard and learn my craft. And so it was really an exercise in following by example as my preferred method of leadership. And it wound up ultimately being successful. We went on to go to the state championship in the largest division in the state of Tennessee. Um, and we finished with a 14 and one record. But this same path continued on my way to college. And it was the same story. It was a different position, a different uniform, higher stakes, um, the same formula and even success at another level, um, both on an individual level, but also on a team level. Um, it was a different position because I had never learned how to play or I'd never played wide receiver before, before I set foot on Harvard's campus. I'd always been a quarterback. But I was fortunate to be a part of a team that brought my coach his first Ivy League title. Um, and by the time I was a senior, I learned how to play the receiver position. And I was named uh, Harvard's all-time leading receiver and the only player in Harvard history to run, catch, throw, and return a touchdown in the same season. But the point is not the success, but rather the fact that following to lead is replicable. And if you can learn to be a great follower, you will inevitably learn to be a great leader. And I wanna make a point about leading because it's important uh, because you'll sometimes have a bad leader. And just because you have a bad leader does not mean you have to be a bad follower. In fact, you learn your greatest lessons from your bad leaders. And it's not always all bad, and you actually can reverse 
their traits. So I want to move to the next theme, and it's this notion of continuous napping, mapping. But before I do, there's a snapshot of a younger me. Uh, the notion of continuous mapping is complicated, and you know it's not as complicated as the life of Homer Simpson or even the map that he's looking at. But this was a concept that didn't emerge for me until after I graduated from college. And the basics are this, you need a plan. Um, and it's more complicated than just needing a plan, but you actually need your map to be a living document. Um, you've got to create it, it's okay if it changes. In fact, I can remember going off to college and going backwards a bit and thinking I wanted to be a doctor, a pediatrician to be specific, but it wasn't until after four semesters, chemistry five, economics 10, psychology one, sociology three, and then government 10, that I didn't realize that I wasn't gonna be anyone's doctor and I wasn't going to anyone's medical school. And that's okay because new fields emerged, I was exposed to new things and I was open to the change. And some of this was attributable even to my mentor that helped me develop the frameworks for my future maps. And I can remember my coach at Harvard, uh, he was often quoted in the Boston Globe and uh, he would say in practice, you know, TP, one day you're gonna be governor of Tennessee, you just wait because I believe in you. And it was words of inspiration and also guidance and direction that helped think about what these maps would ultimately look like for me. Um, but I wanna get back to the map for a minute because it is real and the map shouldn't necessarily be done in pen, but in fact, it should be done in paper. And this is what one of my maps looked like. This is a replica from 15 years ago, and it's got twists and turns. Um, it's got different occupations and all of the things in between. The key is you start with your dream job at the end, and then you backwards map to determine how you get there. And every year or so, you take your pencil out or your pen and you scribble things off and you make adaptations to your map. Because life changes, you'll get new opportunities and ultimately this map will help you make educated decisions that will guide your longer term future. And so that also connects directly to this notion of taking risks, but well thought risks. And this is a tough one because I don't want to be the guy that shows up and tells you it's okay to take risk and then you fail and it costs you a lot. But I believe it's okay to take risk and it's okay to fail. And you have to prepare yourself. You have to have a map. You have to understand pros and cons. And for me, there are three instances in my career and in my story that stand out. The first is being a sports agent. I graduated from law school and I was representing three players three clients that were teammates of my younger brothers at the University of Memphis and Northwestern at the time. Um, and I had an opportunity to go work at a big law firm right out of law school, and I decided not to, and I decided to go work for my mentor at a big agency and represent the likes of Donovan McNabb and Dwayne Wade and Brian Westbrook and Brandon Marshall. Um, and it didn't work out. Well, kind of, because I had the opportunity to do my dream job. I was in the green room, and I was Jerry Maguire, and I was having the time of my life. But I realized it wasn't for me, and as a result of that, I actually had to go backwards, and I found myself at a big law firm, two years behind my class, learning things that they had already learned because I had taken a chance. But I would never do it again differently because that chance afforded me a lifetime opportunity. The second chance or risk that I took was related to moving back to Memphis. And this one was a tough decision because while I love Memphis and I wanted to always be back in my hometown, I didn't want to be back in my 20s or 30s, but in, instead I wanted to be here in the twilight of my career. And so here I am, I find myself at Chicago Public Schools, the third largest school system in the country. I'm one of the youngest members of the cabinet. I have responsibilities to transform K-12 education in one of the largest urban systems in the world. And I get a call from my hometown saying, come home. And it's one thing to be a small fish in a big pond, but it's another thing and a whole other thing to be a growing fish in that big pond. But I went back to my map. 
I thought about what the future looked like. And I determined that there was a pathway through Memphis to reach all of my goals. And I took it. And that risk led me to where I am today at the Downtown Memphis Commission. And so once I got settled into Memphis, I began committing to civic duties. I got to understand what was important about downtown. I was serving on the Downtown Commission's sister and affiliate boards. And it was important to me to understand why economic development was important, like education. But an opportunity presented itself, and I got to know the president at the time, and he suggested that he was going to be leaving soon, and he thought I may be a good fit in the future to be the president. And this was a total stretch to even consider, because I have a government degree, I have very little experience in economic development. I had been working in education. I was relatively young. These are jobs that are typically reserved for economic development professionals and folks that have much longer uh, years of experience. And so I researched, I had conversations with mentors, I went back to my map, um, I thought about my experiences, and I ultimately decided to put my name in the ring. And when people tell you that intelligence, preparation, and passion don't matter, I think you should call them a liar because they do matter because that's how I found myself in my position today. And so going through that interview process, being named president, realizing that these types of things are possible for our downtown, thinking about the future, bringing major corporations like ServiceMaster, understanding what it takes to bring the next generation of Memphians and folks to Memphis and to our center city was really important. And it actually is the culmination of my story. It's a simple story. It's one, like I said, of hard work and acquired talent. I didn't know how to play receiver, but I figured it out. I'm becoming my first um, president and CEO, and I'm understanding what this means and how to be a real, real impactful servant leader. And I've had to work. I had to work at the craft. I've also had to acquire knowledge and surround myself with really smart people. But those three thing, themes continue to guide my decision making. And what I believe is most important is my impact. And remember, my, my story started in Memphis. And I believe, just like you, if your story starts in Memphis, it should end with an impact on Memphis. And so whether it's in the middle of your career, at the end of your careers, you should think about how you, how we, can help impact the future of Memphis. And to me, the future of Memphis is now. And we need all of you to help make the now better. Thank you.